Greetings, friends, and welcome to worship here at Pemina Parish on this first Sunday after Christmas. As you can see, we're not exactly in one of the sanctuaries of either St. Paul's or Zion Calvin. Right now, we are gathered in my home in Morden, and we're gathered around my campfire. Often after Christmas, after all of the rich foods and the feasting, there's a need for our stomachs to have something a little lighter, something like a simple bowl of soup. So the same is true for our spirits in our lives of worship. After the intensity and feasting of Advent and Christmas, sometimes our spirits need something just a little bit simpler. So our worship services on the 27th and the 3rd are going to be just a bit pared down. We're gonna gather around the campfire and just share some time with one another. We're still going to have some music. Faye and Wayne and also Susan were able to do some advanced recording for us before Christmas Eve, and so we're grateful to them for having provided us with some music. Just a quick announcement. Over the past few weeks, a number of us on leadership team have been hearing from folks that they're not getting their news and notes. And that's a concern for all of us. We wanna make sure that you are in on what's going on at Pemina Parish. And so we encourage you, if you haven't been receiving your news and notes, one, check the office to make sure that they have their correct email address. Two, always check your spam and your promotions folders. These are mass emails that go out and mass emails often go into spam or promotions folders. And also you wanna make sure that you check the website since most of what goes into news and notes ends up on the website as well. And if you hear of folks who don't know that we've been online, please feel free to share that news with others. The best way to do that is through word of mouth. So as always, we want to begin our worship service by acknowledging the land upon which we are gathered. So we give thanks to God for the creation of this land. And we acknowledge that we live in Treaty 1 territory, the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, the Cree and Dakota peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. May we learn to live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its peoples. Today, our campfire is going to be our sign of Christ's light with us. And the space around the campfire is a symbol of the fact that all are welcome around the campfire, that all are part of the community. I suspect that over the past week, a number of us have had a lot of very different experiences of Christmas and have experienced a wide variety of emotions, probably joy at some of the connections that we have been able to have, whether those are physically distant or through windows or through on the phone or through Zoom but also sadness at the connections that we weren't able to have. And this year, particularly sadness after hearing about the house fire that happened on Christmas Eve. I know that many of you were good friends with the couple. Their names have not yet been released, but I know that there are a number of you who were, who were dear friends with them. And there are many others who have been touched by their lives in our community and such tragedies, they move us to shock and grief. And our grieving is complicated even more this year by the fact that we can't gather in the ways that we normally do in funerals or memorial services. But there are some things that we can do. If you are able, you might want to write the names of the couple down on a ribbon and take them down to Confederation Park and tie them to one of the blue Christmas trees. And you can do this as a way of honoring their memory, but also as a way of expressing your sadness. If you have children in your home who have perhaps got driven by the fire site and have expressed some sadness or fear, this is also a good way for them to share their sadness or fear with God, to have them write it down on a ribbon and go and tie it to a tree. Those kinds of actions are powerful ways for children and adults to work through our emotions. You might want to spend some time thinking about the couple and what they valued and what they meant in our community and make a donation in their memory. You could do that now or in the days and weeks to come. At some point, there will probably be some direction given as to where donations might go. And I would encourage you, if you were dear friends with the couple, to call up other friends and family and to share stories. 
We often do this when we're sitting around our tables at memorials or at funeral services, but we can do this one-on-one -on, -one on the phone as well. Sharing stories is a beautiful way to honor their memory and to express and acknowledge our own sadness. Today, I want to invite you to a moment of silence as we hold the couple in our hearts, as well as our community and our first responders. And I will close that time of silence in prayer. Please join me in silence. God of love, your son was born to live among us, to know us in our joy and in our sadness. In his life and in his death, he knew grief to his core. We are not alone in our grief. And after Jesus' passing, you sent the Holy Spirit to move among us, the Spirit who intercedes for us when our sadness is beyond speech. She intercedes with us with sighs too deep for words. And so we pray that you will be present with all grieving, family and friends. We pray your presence with all first responders who worked so hard on Christmas Eve and who needed to return to that work whether things went well or not. We pray your presence with our community that is changed through this loss. May we know the depth of your comfort and the breadth of the hope we have in you. Amen. For our call to worship this morning, I'd actually like to read the verses of Joy to the World. We often sing these verses when we're all gathered together and we're experiencing a, you know, that Christmas joy together. But we can also hear these words as an expression of everlasting hope for our world. This is in Voices United number 59. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth. The Savior reigns, let all their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. He rules the earth with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. We're going to join together in song now as Wayne leads us in Go Tell It on the Mountain, which is Voices United number 43. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds camp their watching, or silent flocks by night, behold through. Down in our 
salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Go Our scripture reading today, I'd like to share two passages. The first are gospel reading from the Gospel of Luke, and the second is a short passage from our um, New Testament reading in Galatians. And I specifically chose that passage because it's it shows how the writer of the letter to the Galatians is remembering the story of Jesus's birth and giving it new meaning for the people of Galatia. So First, our text from Luke. And this text takes place as Joseph and Mary are bringing Jesus to the temple to be dedicated eight days after his birth. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout. Looking forward to the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. I love that story, reading about Simeon and Anna, who had been waiting their whole lives to meet this, this Messiah. It's quite something to imagine living your entire life with that anticipation. And now from Galatians. Galatians 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God.
till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Every year during Advent, we make an Advent journey and we walk with the prophets and the shepherds and the angels and Mary and Joseph toward the manger. We make this journey along with them in anticipation of the birth of Jesus. And as a child, I always thought this was, this was quite strange that we were anticipating and waiting and preparing for something that had already happened. As I've grown older, I've come to recognize that we're, we're not just anticipating something that is to come, we're remembering something from the past and bringing it into our present. We are remembering an ancient story of Jesus' birth and giving it new birth in our own context. We bring it to life again through the interaction between the ancient story and our story. And in that way, we are anticipating the birth of Jesus in our midst over and over and over again. And I think we really see this come to life in some of the songs that we sing. Often our Christmas carols, they can seem almost as ancient as the, the birth narrative in our scriptures. Songs like Joy to the World or Silent Night, Away in a Manger, or A Little Town of Bethlehem, O Holy Night. They can feel as ancient as the story, but they really aren't. Those songs were written much later, but in very particular contexts, where they were doing the same thing that we're doing here. They were remembering the ancient story and bringing it to life anew 
in their own context. And I was really grateful that Wayne was willing to sing Oh Holy Night for us. As I've been listening to the song throughout the Advent Christmas season, I've kept hearing certain phrases over and over again. The phrase particularly that was sticking with me was, all oppressions shall cease. And it made me wonder about the context in which that song was written. What was it about that time that made those words come out from the story of Jesus's birth and from the words of the prophets? And so I was doing some digging and I, and I found some stuff out about the song, O Holy Night. And that particular piece came about in kind of a strange way. It was written in 1843, and it was written by a man named Plessis Capot. But he didn't just write it on his own. He was commissioned to write it as a poem. Because he was asked by the parish priest to write this poem to, um, to celebrate the renovation of an organ. The church in their um, small French community had a wonky organ and their wonky organ needed to be repaired, renovated. And so when it was finally done, this, this uh, amazing organ was finally renovated, the parish priest wanted to celebrate and it was going to be revealed on Christmas Eve. And so he commissioned Capot to write a poem for Christmas Eve. And Capot was really um, honored that the parish priest had asked him. He was a wine uh, merchant in town. He's also an accomplished poet, but he was also an atheist. <laughs> and he was, but he was honored that the priest had asked him. And so he, he sat with the text and he, he imagined himself in the story of the birth of Jesus. And he created this beautiful poem to be used on Christmas Eve. And, and the priest and, and others thought it was so beautiful that it needed to be put to music. And so a friend of Capo's named, um, Adolf Adams, he was an accomplished musician, and so he put some music to it and created this beautiful carol that we know as O Holy Night, but which at that time was known as Midnight Christians. And uh, Adams um, was Jewish. So the words of an atheist inspired by the biblical story combined with the music from a Jewish man formed this carol that really took hold in France. It became very popular and was just really, um, really meaningful for people. And it was just not as meaningful for the church though. The church really didn't like it very much because it was, they found out later on that um, Capot was quite socialist actually. Um, he was atheist and he was socialist. <laughs> and um, they found out that uh, Adams was Jewish. So these two non-Christians had created this beautiful piece of sacred music for the church. And they also thought the text sounded way too socialist. It didn't sound religious enough for the church. And so they tried to quash that song, but they couldn't. It had already taken hold in the community. And they don't know if it took hold because it sounded so socialist. And that was the, the inspiration that the people were looking for or in spite of it. But it was, it came to life in a very particular context. And sometime later, there was a Unitarian minister named John Sullivan Dwight who heard this piece of music, this French piece of music, and it really struck a chord with him because he worked as a Unitarian minister in the United States and he was an abolitionist. So he was fighting against slavery in the US and he, he was really caught by the words that the slave is our brother and that all oppression shall cease. And so he took that song, he translated it into English, and he gave it its name that we know, O Holy Night. And that song came to life again. That story of Jesus was born again among the abolitionist movement in the United States. So through our songs and through our stories, as we remember, we bring those into our present and we create new meaning and Jesus is born again among us over and over again. And I've wondered a lot over the past, past year really, how, how our current circumstances of being in a pandemic, how that will impact the songs and stories that are written in our time 
as we remember that ancient story and bring it into this context, how is Jesus being born anew in this place? And how will we express that? And I found just, you know, in the past week or two, that a song has been written. A beautiful Christmas song has been written that really um, tries to bring that ancient story into our present context. And it's interesting because we live in a very different world than they did in 1843 when O Holy Night was originally written. And so this particular piece is multimedia. It has video components and there's visuals that, that really work to bring to light the connection between that ancient story and our contemporary circumstance. So I wanted to share that song with you today as an example of just how beautiful it is that Jesus is born among us over and over again, that that ancient story that is in the past comes into our present over and over again. just isn't the Christmas we order, it's not what we expect. We want our winter wonderland, our party plans are wrecked. But don't we know we're not the first to have a world turned upside down? Joseph and Mary must have felt this way, out of place in an unknown time. Such a random way They're all stressed out in Bethlehem Just what a normal day Still even in the strangest times There's good news to be found What are the things that we're thankful for When we stop and we look around you to join with me in prayer this Christmas season as we pray to the God who is our God of hope and peace and joy and love. Let us pray. And if you hear some extra noises in the background, that's just my family moving around upstairs. Feel free to just let those float away. Let's pray together. God of love, you came to us in the form of a child, a baby, your son. You came to bring us hope. You came to show us the way of peace, the way to live with joy and to show your love to each other. And so we pray with confidence to you that you hear our prayers. 
This morning, we pray for those who are dear to us, those whom we love and those whom we hold hope for, whether it is hope in illness or in struggle. We want for them fullness of life, and so we hold them in your care. Emmanuel, God with us, surround them with your love. God, we bring to you our community, our community that has been shaken by tragedy, our community that has had struggles related to COVID, but also just everyday struggles as well. We pray for those who do not have the daily necessities that they need, and we pray for all those who are longing for a life with more peace and joy in it. Emmanuel, God with us, surround us all with your love. God, we bring to you our nation, our nation and all its leaders, particularly as we move into this time of receiving vaccinations, that your spirit would move and bring wisdom to all those who are making decisions and that there would be fairness and justice and that those most in need would receive what, what they need in this time. Emmanuel, God with us. Surround us all with your love. And God, we bring to you our world, our world that is aching and groaning. And in the midst of all that aching and groaning, there is still joy. There is still laughter. And we ask that you would surround it all that we would know that you are in and around and above and below, that you are in all things. God, for our world, we ask, Emmanuel, God with us, surround our world with your love. God, we ask all this in the name of your Son, who entered our world as a child, a wee baby with tiny hands and feet and endless possibility. Amen. Before we close our service, I just want to remind you that we've almost come to the end of 2020. Finally. It is almost over. And so there are only a few days left for all of us to practice generosity in a year that has honestly needed quite a lot. Financial gifts can be given to the work of Pemina Parish, but also to mission and service through the mail or dropping it off at the church or by e-transfer. Let us share Christmas love through generous giving in our community and beyond as each of us is able and as each of us discerns. And now, as we go from worship today, go in peace. I'm reminded that Jesus was born, alleluia, and is being born among us always, even now. Alleluia, amen. Go in peace.